This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi guys, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 28, Lauren McConnell, part two. If you haven't listened to last week's episode yet, I recommend you go back and listen to that one first. My sources for this week's episode were the same as part one, notjustforlawyers.com, Justice for Kaylee, Find a Grave, Wikipedia, Mothers of Lost Children, Indiana, The Star Press, Domestic Violence Kills, Indiana, The Associated Press, The Dream and Demon, The Walker Royston Report, Remembering Lauren McConnell, 10-3-2004-3-9-2010 Facebook Group, and The Little Lauren Facebook Group. Before we get started, take a listen to this promo from one of my new favorite podcasts, Crimatorium. Crimatorium translates to a place where crime resides. The cases covered include, but are not limited to, murder, scams, abuse, missing persons, cold cases, old cases, new cases, and lesser known cases. Crimatorium covers all of it worldwide. My fascination with true crime goes back to when I was a young girl. Couple that fascination with my love of reading, writing, music, and storytelling. The transition to podcasting was a foregone conclusion. New episodes are released bi-weekly with bonus episodes in between from time to time. Take the next step and listen to Crimatorium, and then subscribe via your favorite platform. Join me in the place where crime resides. If you like your podcasts well-researched, you'll love Crimatorium. Just a quick recap of last week, when I told you about the early life and brutal death of five-year-old Lauren Michelle McConnell. When Lauren was admitted to Riley Children's Hospital in Indianapolis on March 3, 2010, she weighed a scant 28 pounds and had absolutely no fat reserves. She was covered in injuries, had a deadly level of salt in her blood, and had been displaying increasingly disturbing behavior while living in Indiana with her father, stepmother, and three adult members of her stepmother's family, behavior that many believe was caused by constant sexual abuse, likely at the hands of her step-grandfather. All the while, Amber's mother, who lived in Tennessee, had been exhausting every method possible to find her, but by the time someone told her where her daughter was, it was too late. Lauren died in the hospital on March 9, 2010, with her mother by her side. Let's pick up Lauren's story where we left off after Lauren died in March of 2010 and her father and stepmother, Ryan and Brittany McConnell, were arrested in June of 2010 in connection with her death. At the time of their arrests, Ryan was 33 years old and Brittany was not quite 25. In February of 2011, Ryan was granted a divorce from Brittany, pending payment of related court fees. On February 15, 2011, Brittany McConnell's family paid a 10% non-refundable premium of $3,000 to a bail bondsman, allowing Brittany to walk free from jail, however temporarily. Meanwhile, Ryan's public defender, John Brook, was busy making all kinds of requests, including asking for a test jury to be seated to determine whether or not he could get a fair trial in Muncie and requesting the real jury be sequestered during his trial. Brittany's public defender, Zaki Ali, requested her trial be moved to another county due to pretrial publicity potentially tainting the jury pool. 
Brittany's trial was scheduled to begin on May 9, 2011. Ryan's was set for June 6. Before either case could get to trial, however, Ryan struck a deal with prosecutors, pleading guilty to a reduced charge of neglect of a dependent, a Class B felony, in exchange for his testimony against his own estranged wife, Brittany, at her trial. As a result of the plea agreement, Ryan faced up to 20 years in prison, as opposed to the maximum 50-year sentence Brittany faced for her Class A felony charge of neglect of a dependent, resulting in death. The plea agreement document was submitted to the court by Deputy Prosecutor Eric Hoffman and Ryan's attorney, John Brooke, and it suggested that Ryan may also provide information about others who may have been involved in Lauren's death. In other words, he was ready to squeal to save his own hide. Potential targets of investigations were named in the agreement, including Brittany and three other members of her family who were under investigation but had not yet been charged. Another document was filed the same day as the plea agreement, a 10-page affidavit ordered sealed by Judge Thomas Cannon Jr., which was said to contain factual statements made by Ryan McConnell describing abuse and or neglect inflicted upon Lauren McConnell by a certain person or persons. The document stated that Ryan desires to aid in the investigation and prosecution of those persons responsible for the abuse, neglect, and death of Lauren McConnell. His cooperation would include making himself available for pre-trial interviews as well as providing truthful testimony during grand jury proceedings and any subsequent trials. Brittany's attorneys attempted to suppress testimony regarding comments made by her four-year-old son, K.L., and Ryan's 10-year-old daughter, Kaylin, about Brittany's treatment of Lauren, including Kaylin's remarks to psychologist Kenneth McCoy about Brittany beating Lauren's feet with sticks. Dr. McCoy also examined K.L., who said that Lauren died because she got too many spankings. Judge Cannon ultimately ruled that the psychologist's testimony could be presented and at the same time, he ruled to allow the prosecution to present most, but not all, of Lauren's autopsy photos during trial. Deputy Prosecutor Eric Hoffman had argued to present the photographs to show Lauren's severe emaciation at the time of her death. Brittany's request to have her trial moved from Delaware County was ultimately denied. The trial of 26-year-old Brittany McConnell began on Monday, May 10, 2011. Hoffman gave an emotionally charged opening statement suggesting to jurors that Lauren was the recipient of severe abuse at the hands of her stepmother and possibly others in the home, which he described as a house of horror. He said when Lauren was removed from her mother's home in Tennessee in August of 2009, she was a beautiful, happy, loving five-year-old girl. But over the next seven months, she changed into a pale, fragile, malnourished, and exhausted child who was beaten, abused, tortured, and neglected. During his opening argument, Hoffman mentioned that when Lauren died, her body was mysteriously full of salt, and that there was an abundance of salt in the family's home, including a large spaghetti sauce jar full of salt. He described the punishments inflicted upon Lauren by her stepmother, saying, The last six months of Lauren's life was a living hell. Brittany's defense attorney, Zaki Ali, did not make an opening statement to jurors. I have never heard of a trial in which both parties didn't make an opening statement. What a weird choice. On Tuesday, May 11th, Lauren's mother, Amber Huggins, testified through tears about holding her precious daughter in her final moments after being removed from life support. Amber also talked about her months-long effort to locate her daughters. Dr. Kenneth McCoy testified on May 11th about Kaylin's description of the punishments inflicted on Lauren, including foot and hand beatings with a stick and being forced to do exercises. He testified that Kaylin had told him she and Lauren had received the hardest whipping a kid can ever get. Ryan McConnell's testimony also began on Tuesday. Prosecutor Jeffrey Arnold led him through questions about the deal he had struck with prosecutors. On the stand, Ryan said, Looking back on everything now, I could have done something more to stop the abuse. I believe Brittany is guilty. I just want the truth to be known. It is what it is. While being questioned by Mr. Arnold, Ryan told the jurors that Kaylin and Lauren were in Brittany's care for up to 14 hours every day while he went to work at a local factory in addition to attending classes at Ivy Tech. During his continued testimony on Wednesday, Ryan said that Brittany told him at one point, Lauren needs to start being good, or I'm going to break her. He said he removed Lauren from Amber's custody in August of 2009 at the urging of Brittany and her family members who wanted the child support payments Lauren's presence would bring. 
Ryan said, We just needed the money. Ryan said on the stand that he was physically intimidated by Robert Lee, who was larger than him, which was part of the reason he went along with Brittany and her family's ideas. Linda Smith, Ryan's aunt and Robert's mother, testified on May 12th as well, saying that Lauren was a delightful child, a pleasure to be around. The child could light up a room with her smile. Linda described an incident about a month before Lauren died when she visited the home and was shocked to see Lauren shivering in an ice-cold shower. When she confronted Brittany, she testified, Lauren's stepmother replied that the little girl was used to cold showers. Linda testified that Lauren looked terrible, like she had lost 20 pounds when she couldn't afford to lose one. At that time, Brittany explained to Linda that the doctor told them Lauren had anorexia and that she was taking medication and seeing a psychiatrist. In addition, Linda testified that Brittany wasn't nice to Lauren, who she said was always grounded. She had observed that Brittany treated Lauren very differently from the other children, forced Lauren to call her mommy, and showed no love whatsoever for the little girl. Linda's testimony also included her account of an incident in which she saw Brittany's four-year-old son, K.L., intentionally kick a door so it smashed Lauren's fingers. Brittany tried to explain it away as an accident, but when Linda insisted it wasn't, Brittany said, Well, K.L., I guess I'm going to have to spank you because everybody is mad at me. Linda said Brittany swatted him on the butt and he laughed at her and that was it. Linda also testified that Brittany exhibited clear dominance over Ryan. Thursday, May 13th brought testimony from medical staff, including Mary Vergesi, an emergency room doctor from Riley Hospital for Children, and Laura Pachlowski, a primary care doctor from Riley's pediatric ICU, who said of Lauren's degree of emaciation, it was something you'd see in a third world country. Dr. Vergesi testified that when Lauren cried in response to painful stimuli, she had no tears. She appeared coquettic and malnourished with her bones sticking out on her cheeks and ribs. One juror submitted a written question to Dr. Pachlowski, asking if high sodium levels could cause hallucinations, to which the doctor replied yes. During the testimony on Thursday of Sergeant Jimmy Gibson, jurors were shown 22 photographs of Lauren, most taken during her hospitalization and two taken during her autopsy. While the photos were passed amongst the jurors, two of them became visibly upset, wiping away tears and shaking their heads in disbelief at what they had seen. One juror stood up abruptly and asked to be excused, but the judge asked him to sit down before calling a brief recess. After a meeting in the judge's chambers, it was determined that the man would remain on the jury. I can only imagine the horror of what those people had to see. On Friday, May 14th, Dr. Andrea Weist, the medical director of Riley's Pediatric Intensive Care Unit, testified that the entire team of physicians treating Lauren during her final days all believed the little girl had been subjected to forcible salt intake, which contributed to her death. Dr. Weist said the consumption of a very large amount of salt raised the sodium in Lauren's blood to a lethal level, and her body, weakened by abuse and neglect, had been unable to recover from the shock and seizures brought on by the elevated sodium level. She believed Lauren was the victim of active physical abuse, and she had notified the hospital's child abuse team shortly after Lauren arrived on March 3, 2010. Dr. Weist testified that when Ryan and Brittany mentioned Lauren was under the care of Dr. Shoemaker, she said she would give him a call because she knew him. At that point, she said, They told me they had not actually seen him. When defense attorney Zaki Ali asked Dr. Weist why other medical professionals, including the ones who examined Lauren for a possible head injury just hours before she was admitted to Riley Hospital, didn't realize how serious Lauren's condition was. Dr. Weist replied, Anyone who saw that child should have known. I would have thought anyone on the street would have known something was wrong. Other witnesses testified that after Ryan and Brittany assured them that Dr. Shoemaker was treating Lauren for malnutrition, they focused their attention on the little girl's other problems. With Brittany's trial about to stretch into its second week, speculation ran rampant about the identities of the other household members who were being investigated for possible prosecution. Most of that speculation zeroed in on 44-year-old Robert E. Lee, Brittany's stepfather. The Star Press reviewed court documents, including a 30-page interview from 2002 with then 16-year-old Brittany Lee, in which Brittany said her stepfather had been sexually abusing her since she was between the ages of 5 and 7, too many times to count, almost every day. Most of Brittany's allegations described Robert fondling his teenage stepdaughter, at other times forcing her to expose herself or watch him masturbate. She also alleged that he often watched her bathe and made her pose for him in a provocative manner. 
Brittany told investigators at the time, He just tells me not to say anything because if I told anybody that it would hurt my mom and she wouldn't love me anymore, and then he would hurt me. The documents indicated that Brittany was abused in exchange for the ability to leave the home. Brittany was quoted as saying, He would make me stroke him or, you know, kiss him before I could do anything with my friends. She also said Robert told her, I don't love you like a daughter. I love you like my mate. During the investigation into Lauren's death, police asked Brittany repeatedly if she thought her stepfather might have abused Lauren in the same way. While it has never been proven that Robert molested Lauren, she did exhibit many behaviors associated with child victims of sexual abuse, including toilet training regression, self-hatred, sleep disturbances, changes in eating habits, mood swings, self-harming behaviors, and not talking as much as usual. When questioned in 2010, Angie Rice Lee told police she didn't remember Robert's arrest in 2002 or his subsequent prosecution and prison time, which resulted in Brittany spending over two years in foster care. You'd think that would be something a mother would recall. Robert was described by police officers in reports as someone whose intellectual abilities were so limited that he was almost unable to carry on a conversation. Robert's only income was his Social Security disability payments. Ryan testified earlier that he knew about the skeletons in the Lee family closet when he agreed to move in with the family, along with his wife and their four children. He said, I had nowhere else to go. It was easier to go along with what Brittany wanted, than pay the consequences later. Ryan had also testified that Robert said he would hurt Ryan if he complained about the way Brittany and Robert treated Lauren. Ryan said, They weren't hitting her, so I really didn't make a big deal out of it. He added that Brittany told him, she would divorce me and I would never see my children again, if he mentioned Lauren's abuse to anyone. When Deputy Prosecutor Eric Hoffman was asked about possible future prosecutions, he replied, This trial is only round one. On Monday, May 17th, prosecutors Jeffrey Arnold and Eric Hoffman presented a recording of an interview Brittany gave to Muncie Police in March of 2010, just hours before Lauren was pronounced dead in the hospital. In the interview, Brittany told Sergeants Jimmy Gibson and Linda Cook that her stepdaughter went from skipping a meal or two to not eating unless we made her eat. Brittany told both officers, There's a lot of stuff we could have done sooner. I know we should have got her help. We didn't know where to go. They seemed to have some idea how to start, considering they lied to every medical provider they saw about Lauren supposedly being treated by Dr. Shoemaker for her malnutrition, but I digress. Also during the interview, Brittany told the officers that Lauren never said anything if Robert Lee was sexually assaulting her. She never told us, Brittany said, although she did tell the investigators that Ryan had voiced concerns about his two daughters living in the house with Robert, considering his history. While Brittany listened to the recorded interview being played in court, she cried for the first time during her trial. Her attorney left the defense table to get her some tissues. Dr. Antoinette Lasky from Riley Hospital testified on Tuesday, May 18th, telling jurors that Lauren was the victim of inflicted trauma and child abuse and describing for the court her first glimpse of the dying girl in the PICU at Riley. I couldn't believe she was still alive. I see a lot of kids, but it was that bad. There was nothing to her, not a single ounce of body fat. She was covered in bruises. Dr. Lasky testified that Lauren's brain injuries, caused by the ingestion of a massive amount of salt, made the little girl's recovery impossible, saying, We tried very hard to save Lauren. The fact is that she was in total system failure. With a laser pointer, Dr. Lasky drew the attention of the jurors to Lauren's painfully thin state, as well as pointing out bruises on the girl's body, including those on her back, her legs, and the soles of her feet. On Wednesday morning, the state rested its case without calling additional witnesses. Brittany McConnell had planned to take the stand in her own defense, but as the defense began presenting its case, she only took the stand to announce that she had changed her mind about testifying, saying, I do not want to take the stand. The only witness who ultimately testified for the defense was Samra Jojo Lee, Brittany's half-sister, whose testimony on Wednesday was brief and consisted of Samra providing Zaki Ellie with 24 photos she took of Lauren and other members of the family between August of 2009 and January of 2010. With Samra on the stand, Prosecutor Arnold made a pointed jab at her, apparently referring to the fact that she lived and thrived in the home while Lauren wasted away. Did you have a chance to have a good breakfast this morning? That question drew an objection from the defense, but Judge Cannon allowed the question to stand. Samra replied that she had not yet eaten breakfast, and Arnold asked, I bet you don't miss many meals then, do you? I love this guy. 
Closing arguments took place on the morning of Thursday, May 20th. Eric Hoffman gave the prosecution's closing remarks, saying that Brittany McConnell beat, tortured, starved, and neglected her stepdaughter, putting Lauren in an early grave. Addressing the falsehoods Brittany repeatedly told medical providers about Lauren supposedly being treated, Hoffman said she told lie after lie after lie. He pointed at Brittany at one point, saying to her, You had the duty to protect Lauren, and you miserably failed. Brittany did not react. Hoffman told jurors, Lauren McConnell didn't stand a snowball's chance in hell of surviving the abuse and neglect she suffered in that house of horror, telling them that a conviction could not erase the harm done to Lauren and the ones who loved her, but a little bit of justice will go a long way. During the defense's closing argument, Zaki Ali told jurors he cannot make excuses for Brittany, but said she was just one of several people who failed Lauren McConnell. Ali said Brittany and Ryan lacked the sense and wherewithal to seek treatment for Lauren's worsening condition. He had the nerve to suggest prosecutors should have pursued charges against some of the hospitals and agencies that he said failed to respond appropriately to warning signals and thereby save Lauren's life. Did they not see this child was in distress? At one point, Ali sat in a chair in front of the jury box and told them he would be playing the part of Robert E. Lee, Brittany's stepfather. In character, he said, I molested Brittany when she was five until she was in her early teens. When they moved into the house, I saw another victim, and that was Lauren. Ali, calling Robert a dirtbag, suggested that the man had been the one to give Lauren the fatal dose of salt, concluding that they should not reach a verdict in Brittany's case because you don't have all the pieces in the puzzle. Afterward, prosecutor Jeffrey Arnold rebutted, giving sarcastic praise to Ellie's perhaps Broadway-quality showmanship and telling jurors the investigation was ongoing into others possibly responsible for Lauren's death. Arnold said, Several people did fail Lauren, especially in the last 30 days of her life. Are you going to add yourself to that list of names? He urged the jury, consisting of seven men and five women, to return a guilty verdict and to do it swiftly. The jurors obliged. Deliberations began at 1.35 p.m., and even including a lunch break, by 3 p.m., they were ready with their verdict. Brittany McConnell was found guilty of neglect of a dependent resulting in death. As Judge Cannon read the verdict, Brittany winced but remained otherwise composed, even as she was handcuffed and led out of the courtroom. Her sentencing was scheduled to take place on June 13, 2011, and she faced up to 50 years in prison. After the verdict was read, Lauren's mom, Amber, cried as she showed off photos of Lauren in happier, healthier times. Amber had attended the trial with her husband, Jackie, and her parents, Michelle and Glenn Maddox, saying it was a roller coaster of emotions. Amber told reporters she hoped her daughter's story would prompt other people to report suspected child abuse and neglect. It is our responsibility to protect our children. Amber said, I have two children left and four stepchildren, but my life's not complete without my little girl. Lauren's grandma, Michelle Maddox, said she had a message on her answering machine from Lauren that she planned to keep forever, left by her young granddaughter when she lived with her mother in Tennessee. Michelle said, Most days it still hurts, but the love of her voice, it warms my heart. After the verdict, defense attorney Zaki Ali said, I think she is a scapegoat. I think there are other people out there that should have been charged. Prosecutor Jeff Arnold said, I would have loved to have made this into a murder case, but there was no way that we could prove whether or not Lauren actually ingested that salt on her own. He said that Ali was trying to blame everybody else to get the blame off of Brittany, and that questions about the responsibility and liability of healthcare professionals and agencies would be better resolved through civil litigation, although to the best of my knowledge and research, that was never pursued. Amber, too, said she was waiting for further charges, saying Brittany's conviction did not mean justice had been served. This is my five-year-old daughter, Lauren. There's nothing that this child could have done to deserve what happened to her. I would have rather they did it to me instead of my daughter, any child. Not just my daughter, any child. No child deserves this. It's a beginning. It's a beginning of justice. In an email exchange with the Walker Royston Report, one of the jurors who convicted Brittany, Jim Schenkel, said, We hope no other child will face the same lack of action exhibited by so many in the health care field. Lies or truth from caregivers notwithstanding, they should always follow up when presented with signs of abuse as they were with Lauren. We need to expect better from the professionals we entrust with the care of our children. At the request of Zaki Ali, who asked that Brittany be examined by a psychiatrist or psychologist before being sentenced, 
His client's sentencing hearing was postponed, but June of 2011 was not entirely wasted in the pursuit of justice for Lauren. Late in the afternoon of Tuesday, June 21, 2011, 44-year-old Robert E. Lee, Brittany's stepfather, was arrested and charged with aiding, inducing, or causing neglect of a dependent, a Class A felony, three counts of battery, a Class D felony, and failure to immediately report child abuse, a misdemeanor. Robert was held in the Delaware County Jail. That evening, Prosecutor Arnold said, I'll spend the rest of my career and all the resources of my office chasing down and investigating anybody who had anything to do with the abuse and death of Lauren McConnell and get them in front of a jury. If you were involved in that, look over your shoulder because I'm coming. Have I mentioned that I love this guy? Robert was seen in court on Wednesday, June 23rd, at which time his bond was set at $50,000 cash. His trial was ultimately scheduled for April of 2012. At the court hearing, Robert tried to claim he was illiterate. However, prosecutors brought up the fact that he used Facebook to communicate as proof that this was false. They also pointed out that among Robert's interests listed on Facebook were the Bible and a religious blog. Amber Huggins wrote a heart-wrenching victim impact statement in preparation for Britney's sentencing. The statement read in part, There are no words in the English language to properly, completely, and fully explain how much Lauren's life and our lives have been devastated and forever changed because of Britney's actions. If there was ever a picture of compassion, it would have been Lauren. She loved everybody she came into contact with, told them quite frequently with hugs and kisses and a yeah yous, and never met a stranger. Even as her biological father, stepmother, and three other adults hated her, abused her, starved her, and neglected her, there was never a report of Lauren saying she hated them. She instead reflected that hate upon herself. And knowing my sweet daughter the way I do, she probably loved them all up to her last breath despite what they did because that's who Lauren was. Sir, they did not just kill my daughter's body. They murdered what made Lauren, Lauren. Lauren was never mean. She never kept alone to herself. She never hurt herself or others. She always smiled, laughed, hugged, sang, cuddled. She had so much love and potential, and it was slowly and agonizingly smothered and extinguished by the senseless, cruel acts of evil and hatred by the very people who should have loved and protected her. Because of Brittany's actions, I now only get to watch one daughter grow up instead of two. I have nightmares every time I fall asleep of the sound of my baby crying, screaming, begging me to come save her, and can see in said dreams the look of confusion and fear on her face when I cannot show up. When I am awake, there are ever-constant companions of heartache, loss, grief, and brokenness that have become like unwanted best friends. Because of Brittany's actions, my son, daughter, and four stepchildren have to grow up without their baby sister. I often hear the words, I wish Buggy was here, or I wish Buggy could see. They now have to see their sister, not face to face, but in a cemetery. Kaylin, who was abused also and witnessed the abuse on Lauren, now has to see a therapist once a week. She has suffered extreme psychological trauma. There is no easy way to make it all better for her. My once very happy-go-lucky daughter faces issues of anger and guilt on a daily basis. Brittany changed both of my daughters. Lauren should have graduated kindergarten this last spring. Now I will never get to see my daughter's first day of school, fix her cap and gown at high school graduation, or shed tears of pride at her college graduation. I will never have the joy of helping my daughter on her first date, help her get through her first heartbreak, or help her arrange her wedding. I will never get to hold, see, love the grandbabies Lauren would have given me. There will be no more silly songs sang between Lauren and I. No goofy jokes with her stepdaddy. No hugs and cuddles with her nanny or animal noises on the phone with her papa. No playing games and swinging with her brothers and sisters. We are all responsible for our own actions. By allowing Brittany anything less than the maximum 50 years is allowing her to take no responsibility for her actions. She took a life from a child, not the child's toy. Brittany's atrocious actions deserve not a day shy of the maximum punishment. For actions this severe and cruel to have ruined so many people's lives, 50 years is not enough. For what she put my daughter through, 50 years is not enough. Anything less than the maximum 50 years is simply an injustice to my daughter. So I would humbly ask you to strongly consider nothing short of the maximum punishment. Amber read her 10-minute statement at Brittany's sentencing hearing on Tuesday, August 9, 2011, while holding a pink plastic pony that she said was one of Lauren's favorite toys. Brittany, too, spoke to Judge Cannon during the hearing, saying she was unsatisfied with the case Zaki Ali presented for her. 
She cried as she said, I did let Lauren down, but I didn't do most of the things Ryan said I did. Nothing I could do or say would bring Lauren back. Eric Hoffman argued, It's always been about Brittany, poor, pitiful Brittany, saying the torture Lauren endured shows you the depth of the depravity of this defendant. Prosecutor Arnold said he had never seen a defendant less remorseful for a crime more devastating to a community, adding that while there was no punishment available to fit the facts of this crime, Brittany deserved every minute of 50 years. Judge Cannon, citing the brutal and horrible nature of Brittany's crime against Lauren and referring to the months Lauren lived with Brittany and her family as the nightmare on Ebright Street, sentenced Brittany McConnell to the maximum prison term of 50 years. Thirty-four-year-old Ryan McConnell officially pleaded guilty on Tuesday, October 11, 2011, to his reduced charge of neglect of a dependent. Judge Cannon took the guilty plea under advisement and set a tentative sentencing date for January 9, 2012, which was later rescheduled to May 14 and eventually rescheduled for March of 2013. In January of 2012, the last two arrests were made in connection with Lauren's death. Her step-grandmother, 45-year-old Angela Angie Rice Lee, was charged with aiding, inducing, or causing neglect of a dependent, a Class A felony, and failure to immediately report child abuse or neglect, a misdemeanor. Angie's daughter, 21-year-old Samra Lee, was also arrested and faced the same charges as her mother, except the aiding or inducing charge in her case was a Class D felony. At last, every adult living in the McConnell Lee house where Lauren lived her nightmarish final months had been arrested. At the preliminary hearing for both Angie and Samra Lee, the two women sat next to each other in the jury box wearing blue jail uniforms, their hands cuffed to a waist belt, and their ankles shackled. Angie stumbled and almost fell while shuffling from the witness stand back to the jury box. Angie's bond was set at $31,000 and her trial date set for May 15, 2013. She told the judge she hadn't held a job since 1994 and that she no longer had a source of income because my husband's social security check stopped. Samra's bond was set at $6,000. Her trial was scheduled for May 24th. She told Judge Cannon that she'd never had a job and didn't know her social security number. We're dealing with a bunch of rocket scientists here. Judge Cannon agreed to appoint a public defender to each defendant. Samra was ultimately freed on bond. On March 9, 2012, two days to the day after Lauren's death, Amber Huggins filed a civil lawsuit against Ryan, Brittany, Robert, Angie, and Samra. Also named in the suit were the Southside Church of the Nazarene and three of its officials, youth pastor Timothy Black, pastor Andrew Cole, and his wife Alicia, who was also the church's children's director. In the lawsuit, Amber and her attorney, Ralph Dowling, alleged that these church officials observed Lauren's deplorable physical deterioration, severe emaciation, and widespread bruising shortly before her death and failed to report them to the proper authorities. On Monday, April 9, 2012, Robert E. Lee entered a guilty plea to his Class A felony charge of aiding, inducing, or causing neglect of a dependent, and Judge Cannon agreed to take under advisement a plea bargain, placing a 40-year maximum on Robert's possible prison term. Robert's sentencing was tentatively set for June 4, later pushed back a few weeks. During the April 9th hearing, Robert admitted to making suggestions to Brittany about punishments to inflict on Lauren, said he did nothing to help Lauren while she was wasting away, and admitted he did not report the abusive acts his stepdaughter performed against Lauren. He also said under questioning by Prosecutor Arnold that his wife, Angie, was aware of Lauren's abuse and worsening condition and did nothing to intervene. However, Robert insisted his daughter, Samra, was not present when most of Lauren's abuse took place. Robert's public defender, Doug Mahor, asked Judge Cannon to sentence his client to 20 years in prison with some time suspended, reading aloud an apology letter Robert wrote to Lauren, so much for Robert being illiterate, huh, and requesting the judge consider Robert's poor health. Deputy Prosecutor Eric Hoffman pointed out the hypocrisy in that request, considering Robert's health issues included diabetes, gout, obesity, and nicotine dependence. Hoffman said, The irony stinks up the courtroom that Robert chose to smoke and feed his face while Lauren starved to death in his home. On May 18, 2012, Amber Huggins received a judgment by default in her lawsuit against Brittany, Robert, Angie, and Samra. I've been unable to find the terms of the order. Against Ryan, Amber's lawsuit continued until 2019, which I'll talk about near the end of the episode. 
Robert was sentenced on June 18, 2012, to 40 years in prison for his role in Lauren's death. Judge Cannon told Robert he must have been a monster manifested in the flesh to Lauren in the months before she died. Samra Lee pleaded guilty to her Class D felony charge of aiding, inducing, or causing neglect of a dependent on September 4, 2012. Her sentencing was scheduled for October 15, at which time 22-year-old Samra was sentenced to the maximum of three years two of which to be served in prison, and the third, on supervised probation. Meanwhile, Brittany had been attempting to appeal her conviction on the grounds that the court abused its discretion in denying her defense funds to pay for an expert witness, that the evidence was insufficient to sustain Brittany's conviction on a Class A felony charge, and that the 50-year sentence imposed upon her was inappropriate in light of the nature of the offense and Brittany's character. The Indiana Court of Appeals affirmed the trial court's conviction and sentence. Nice try, Step Monster. On January 22, 2013, it was Angie's turn to enter a guilty plea in front of Judge Cannon. During the hearing, Angie admitted she knew about Lauren's physical abuse and malnutrition and that she had failed to alert police or CPS about it. Her sentencing was scheduled for March 4. In February of 2013, the Southside Church of the Nazarene and the officials named within Amber's civil lawsuit settled with her out of court, and the lawsuit against them was thereby officially dismissed in April of that year. Monday, March 4, 2013, just five days shy of the third anniversary of Lauren's death, 47-year-old Angie Rice Lee was sentenced to 30 years in prison. The sentencing for Ryan McConnell, who was by that time 36, was held the same day as Angie's hearing, March 4th, in the same courtroom at 1.30 p.m. Ryan wept through his 90-minute sentencing hearing, during which his ex-wife, Amber, read another difficult victim impact statement. I used to love Ryan and had planned on spending the rest of my life with him. Now there is nothing left in me for him but pure disdain, disgust, anger, and hatred. Daddies are supposed to be a little girl's king, her protector. Ryan, however, was Lauren's nightmare. Daddies are supposed to lay down their lives for their daughters. Ryan threw Lauren to a known child molester and watched as his own flesh and blood was tortured just because he was scared Robert would beat him up or Brittany would be mad, just to save his own pathetic skin. Your Honor, Ryan is the biggest offender of them all. Lauren was his own daughter, and in my opinion, he's also the worst kind of offender. He obviously has no boundaries on who he will hurt and allow to be hurt. If he has no more compassion and respect for the life of his own flesh and blood than what he's shown, then who's to say he wouldn't allow it to happen to another child in his home? He's already proven he has no respect for a human life unless it benefits him. Lauren was, from birth, Mom's baby, and she would get furious if anyone insisted she was anyone else's baby but Mama's. I love my daughter with every ounce of energy I possess and will love her until my last breath is taken. I miss her more than I could ever hope to express to the court. The hole that has been left in my heart from her death is humongous. I feel incomplete without her. Ryan caused that, that constant feeling of loss, of grief, and not just in my life, in the lives of my whole family, my husband's family, our friends. Ryan's cowardice did that. Of the five people charged with Lauren's death, Ryan had the greater responsibility. He failed tremendously as a father. For his involvement in Lauren's torture, his refusal to get his daughters to safety, and his betrayal to Lauren and Kaylin, he deserves so much more punishment than what this court could order. But I would ask that maximum sentencing be imposed. Prosecutor Arnold called Ryan the most gutless, empty father and human being that I've ever seen, saying he would go to his grave wondering if he did the right thing in offering Ryan a plea deal to secure the convictions of the other offenders in the case. Deputy Prosecutor Hoffman called Ryan a spineless wimp, saying, It's truly pathetic that all of us in the courtroom have more compassion for a child that we never met than her own father did. Ryan sobbed as he apologized to My children, and the Lord, and to Amber and her family. I guess I am just a worthless father, like they said, but I did try to protect her and help her, but I didn't do enough. At the end of the hearing, Judge Cannon sentenced Ryan to the maximum of 20 years in prison. In early 2017, Angie Lee filed a motion requesting an early release from the Indiana Women's Prison in Indianapolis, arguing that she had completed several counseling programs in prison and hoped to start her own housekeeping business if released. Isn't that nice? I wonder if Lauren would have ever opened a business if she had been alive. 
Eric Hoffman said in his reply, The state will not now, nor will it ever, agree or consent to a modification of her sentence, saying Angie's crimes were heinous and appalling. He continued, She was a member of a conspiracy of silence relating to the murder-slash-death, systematic torture, and starvation of a five-year-old child. Not only did she observe barbaric punishments administered to this helpless child, she encouraged Brittany McConnell to administer them. Judge Cannon swiftly denied Angie's motion. 54-year-old Angela Rice Lee, DOC number 217333, is in the custody of the Indiana Department of Corrections, now at the Madison Correctional Facility. The DOC website lists her earliest possible release date as October 23, 2025. 53-year-old Robert E. Lee, DOC number 226365, is imprisoned in the Wabash Valley Level 3 facility in Carlisle, Indiana. His earliest possible release date is listed as December 18, 2030. Brittany McConnell, Indiana DOC number 214615, is incarcerated in the Rockville Correctional Facility in western Indiana. She will be turning 35 in October. With credit for good behavior, according to the State Department of Corrections website, the earliest date she could be eligible for release is March 14, 2034, at which time she'll be 48. It just doesn't seem right that she could be released when she's still young enough to bear children. Eric Hoffman was promoted by Prosecutor Jeffrey Arnold to the title of Chief Trial Deputy Prosecutor in 2012. When Arnold decided not to seek a third term in 2018, Hoffman decided to run. In November of 2018, Eric Hoffman was elected as the 60th prosecutor in Delaware County's 192-year history, assuming his new position on January 1, 2019. Hoffman said Arnold has taught me countless things about being a lawyer, a prosecutor, a husband, and a father. Hoffman met his wife, Kelly, when she was a DCS official who testified at Brittany McConnell's trial. Hoffman said, Six months or a year later, we started going out and eventually got married. Lauren's case, especially testimony from Brittany's trial, has had a lasting effect on Hoffman, who has a stepson, in addition to three daughters born to himself and his wife, Kelly. Their oldest daughter's middle name is Lauren, a tribute to the precious little girl whose death brought Hoffman and his wife together. Jimmy Gibson has officially retired from the Muncie Police Department, but he does continue to work there as a reserve officer, working what they call the sergeant's desk, where he performs duties such as taking reports. In my research for this story, I discovered that, while it was never covered by the media, now 43-year-old Ryan McConnell was paroled in May of 2019 after serving only six of his 20-year sentence. He was evidently released on parole to Idaho, where his parents, Bill and Marcia McConnell, moved in 2017. On August 2nd of this year, Ryan posted photos on Facebook of himself and his father fishing on an idyllic lake under clear blue skies, accompanied by a happy little dog. Isn't that wonderful? Ryan's living life to its fullest while his daughter, who barely got a chance to live at all, rests for eternity under six feet of earth. At the end of July, Ryan seemed to cast bait of a different kind, posting a status reading simply, Hey, dream girl. The only comment on that status was from none other than Samra herself. How lovely that they've continued a friendly relationship after sharing responsibility for a child's death. Since I saw them, Ryan's posts have been deleted or made private. And what's old Samra up to these days? She evidently met the man of her dreams, Ted Reif, in July of 2013 and became engaged to him two months later. A year after that, Samra Lee became Mrs. Samra Josephine Reif. It appears the couple lives in Indiana. She'll be turning 30 this month. In Amber's victim impact statement at Samra's sentencing hearing, she gave some insight into Samra's personality. As my daughter starved to death and wasted away to a living, breathing skeleton, Samra herself was the very picture of obesity. Instead of feeding a very obviously hungry child, Samra was content to dye her hair, pose in sunglasses, and post pictures on Facebook while tending to her farm on Farmville. She could grow imaginary food but couldn't be bothered to walk into the kitchen and make a simple sandwich so Lauren's belly would stop growling. Samra's interests currently appear to include sunflowers, trite self-love quotes, wigs, and posting selfies. Some things never change. Jackie and Amber Huggins are still together and still living in Tennessee. Tragically, they lost a second child last year. Jackie's son, JJ, who was born on September 23, 2000, died unexpectedly on May 16, 2019 at the age of 18. 
His girlfriend, Deja, was pregnant at the time of his death and gave birth to their beautiful daughter in November of 2019. Jackie and Amber are reportedly over the moon about their now nine-month-old granddaughter, their son's last and greatest gift to them. May JJ rest in peace. Amber's lawsuit against Ryan was finally settled in June of 2019, when Ryan was found liable under tort law for the wrongful death of his daughter, Lauren. A judgment was entered for Amber against Ryan for damages in the agreed-upon amount of $300,000, which Ryan was ordered to pay in installments of at least $300 per month once he became employed. His balance with the court is still $300,217, which is the amount of the judgment plus court fees, so it would appear he has not yet obtained a job or begun making payments to Amber. Jackie and Amber's youngest child, Zach, graduated from high school this year. Kay Lynn, who is now 19, graduated high school in 2019. I hope she has found peace and been able to manage the trauma and survivor's guilt inflicted on her by her biological father, his wife, and her twisted family. Amber's son, Cameron, is 21 and got engaged in February of this year. Both Kaylin and Cam call their stepfather, Jackie, Dad. This has been an incredibly complex and difficult story to cover, as you can probably tell by the fact that it had to be two episodes long, but it's essential that in the middle of this mess we don't forget Lauren Michelle McConnell and who she was as a person. Lauren's maternal grandmother, Michelle, remembered her granddaughter beautifully on what would have been Lauren's 10th birthday. Along with a precious photo of the two of them together, Michelle posted in a Facebook group called Little Lauren, It's hard to believe that you would have been 10 years old today. You will forever be the little bug I fell in love with and cherished for five short years. Yet in quiet moments I try to imagine you growing up and wonder if you would still like to wear dresses, I bet you would, and how many bags of chips you could devour in a weekend at Nanny and Papa's. Would you still sing to me and make funny noises with your papa? I know he still would. Each year that passes could never dim our love for you. It only grows stronger. That is the one constant. Love never gives up. I'm confident that you are safely surrounded in perfect love and look forward to when I can hold you again. Happy birthday, baby. I love you beyond infinity. Amber told a story on the Remember Lauren McConnell Facebook page about why she associates found dimes with her daughter's continued presence. The story of the dime. After Lauren passed, I went downstairs outside the hospital to be by myself. I had just held my baby as she took her last breath. I sat down on the ground with my back to the wall and my legs straight out and crossed at the ankles. As I sat and cried, I looked down and in the laces of my shoe, on the side, was a dime. I had kept no money on me while we were at Riley. Either my husband brought me food to her room or my family paid if I ran down. It may seem like coincidence to some, but I know in my heart that it wasn't. They show up in the craziest places in the times I need them. Ever since she found the dime in her shoelaces, whenever she finds one, she takes it as a sign that Lauren, who she calls Bug Boo or Buggy, is with her. According to Amber, Lauren was gentle and sweet always willing to be a helping hand, full of songs and smiles and hugs and kisses. Lauren was very trustworthy. We always said she never met a stranger. I can honestly say I cannot recall a single person that she disliked. Lauren was always playing dress-up. I remember buying, at least once a month, brand new sets of dress-up shoes, tiaras, costume jewelry, little rhinestone scepters. She had been raised to believe she was a princess, and that's how she deserved to be treated. As far as I'm concerned, that's also how Lauren deserves to be remembered. As a sweet, kind, compassionate, loving little princess who had love for everyone. Wherever she is, I'm sure she's wearing the prettiest, sparkliest tiara while she introduces her big brother, JJ, to her countless friends. For all she went through, but more importantly for everything she was, Lauren will never be forgotten. That's it for this week, guys. Join me next week for another case. If you like the show, please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. And please subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. You can also subscribe on YouTube by searching Suffer the Little Children Podcast. 
Visit the website at www.sufferthelittlechildrenpod.com where you can listen to episodes and become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout out by name on the show to exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod and on Twitter at STLC Pod. View photos related to today's case on Facebook and Instagram. Read more about today's case and many others at SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast was written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. Intro theme music is by Dream Note Music. Other music and sound effects for the show were created using sounds from AudioJungle.net. Hug your babies a bit closer tonight. Until next week, bye guys. <laughs>